Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Jamie Allen. I'm the Senior Director of Global Services for Lightbend. Um, I said this to the earlier group as well. I'm still adjusting to the new name as well, so I'll probably say type safe at least once in this talk, if not a lot. But um, this talk is about ACA, but it's meant to be for people who've been using it for a little while. But I will, you know, if there are people in the room who have never seen ACA before, I will go through some real basic stuff at the beginning. How many people here have not used ACA so far? Okay, so I will make sure I go through this then. Because uh, it can be a pretty um, strange tool to get used to. So who am I? Um, I'm the author of a book called Effective ACA. And I mean, it's a pretty small book, which is how I can turn it into a 50 minute presentation. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it, the idea was to create a small book that people would be able to read really quickly and get value from as far as best practices for building actor-based systems. And really, a lot of the stuff that I wrote in there isn't dependent on actors. It's really about writing code that is asynchronous and dealing with you know, distributed systems in general, performance, trying to get a lot of performance out of a thread. Uh, so it's, it's not actor-specific. It's really just about writing systems that are going to be concurrent. And then the other book I'm working on currently, and it's done, by the way, Reactive Do Design Patterns is in its final review phase, which means it's actually going to be released, hopefully, in the next couple months. So the whole point of this talk is to tell you about the ways I've shot my foot off in the past doing actor-based development. I started out in 2009. ACA was a really immature project. And so I was working at a company where we were using OSGI, and therefore, we couldn't pull ACA in because ACA had all of the, the dependencies in the world included in the project. So since we were really restrictive about modularity in our project, there was no way we were pulling in ACA. We started out using the original Scala actors, which were you know, pretty much one-to-one -one port of what Erlang is and some of the rules of Erlang's uh, best practices that are embedded in something called OTP. But it wasn't a great implementation for a couple of reasons that really weren't its fault. Erlang has a different kind of runtime than the JVM, and Erlang has isolation built into that runtime. So you don't have to worry about how you're going to separate things and make sure things aren't visible to other actors. Whereas on the JVM, we have a monolithic heap, and that means that anybody who has a reference to something can do something to it. And you know that's not possible in Erlang. So the Scala actors eventually were deprecated uh, in favor of ACA because ACA really started to progress way beyond what Scala actors were. Scala actors came from a research project at the EPFL. ACA came from the community. So you know, as I started using ACA more, um, I found that it was much more helpful in dealing with things such as location transparency. And that meant that uh, I didn't shoot my foot off quite so much. But I highly recommend that if you're going to start using ACA, you find a way to get some training first. And I'm not trying to sell you light bend training. I'm just recommending that somehow you find a training course or something that will allow you to ramp up really quickly and understand the dynamics of what's going on here. So what are actors? Actors are just like classes that you're used to because you instantiate them and you have instances of them. But you cannot call a method on an actor. You have to send it a message. You've got to define a message and send it to the actor. You can send anything you want to an actor. That's kind of a downside, right? Because you could say that you, know, you don't have the rules about what is an acceptable API. You could send anything you want. But I made this point earlier, this is also like message queues. You can put anything you want into a message queue. There's no real way to define how to structure your message queues such that you know that only these messages will go in it. So it's reflective of that whole space. Um, but that also means that because I'm sending a message, I don't know where the actor lives. It could be on the same box in the same JVM. It might even use the same thread as the actor who sent the message to it. But you don't know any of that for certain. And so your code just says, I'm sending a message. You know, here's my message. Go do something. And you, know, you don't know where that's going to actually take place. So that's a good thing, because in doing so, if we don't care who does the work, we have the ability to scale across multiple boxes. 
any one of those other boxes could be the one that handles the work. It also gives us resilience. If one of the boxes goes down, other boxes can be the consumers. And we don't have to write that inside of our logic of our code. So actors are really, really powerful for writing systems that can scale across multiple machines and deal with things like hardware failures. Akka really shines in that space. So they don't interact with each other via synchronous method calls. You never have that idea of I'm going to call a method on an actor. I'm going to send a message. And actors can be two different types of actors. One is they can represent state. If you, for example, I'm going to use the example here where we have customers, we're, we're a cable company. We have customers and they have um, devices that they watch TV on, whether it's on their tablet or they watch it on their TV with a set-top box and who knows what else. Pretty soon people will be watching TV on Fitbits. But the point is they have devices associated with the customer and they can also have accounts, right? They could have a business account, they could have a home account, they might have several homes. Uh, and then they have applications that run on those devices. I can structure these in actors and have state represented in memory, which is literally moving across machines if you know, a machine fails. You can design systems that can withstand a, you know, a disk failure representing that a machine goes down and you automatically have the actor up over on another box with the state replayed. Those are the kinds of problems Akka is meant to solve. Um, but the simpler way to think about this is if you can follow a worker-based pattern. And in this case, your actors do not have state. Everything is passed to them. And when they receive a message and they have the state in the message, they know what to do as a result of it. This may sound kind of abstract, so I'll be giving some examples very, shor very shortly. And should actors be used everywhere? I make this a point to tell everybody emphatically, no. Right? We want correctness in our code. We don't get that in a message passing scenario where you could send a message to anybody and you don't have any guarantees that the actor who will receive it can even handle that message. It may not be defined to handle whatever message you send. You can't statically check that. And there are, there are research projects going on like uh, something called Akka Typed to try and figure out how to solve this problem, but they're not exactly production ready yet. Uh, we want correctness in our code. We want static check code. So when an actor receives something, we can have code inside of them that are you know, using types and using functional programming that you know, leverage the power of both paradigms. So you have correctness in everything that the actor does from receiving a message and the ability to deal with failures that occur in hardware and wherever else. So actors are always structured in a tree. I've actually seen exceptions to this rule. Um, think about it as though you have a root node, just like a root directory on your computer, right? You have subdirectories and subdirectories of subdirectories, et cetera, et cetera, breaking down into a tree. Well, we have the exact same thing in Akka. We have a root node that you don't control. It's part of the, the toolkit itself. Whenever you create an actor, it always has that supervisor watching over it. And in this case, think about in terms of the C's there, they're customers, right? I can have multiple customers defined. And then underneath those customers, I could have uh, accounts represented and devices represented. And underneath my devices, I can have applications, right? So I have a hierarchy representing a pretty real world view of what is happening in my business live right now as events are coming into my system. So this would be a domain centric ACA implementation, right? This would be with state. My customers have state, their applications have state, their devices have state, etc. And I, I made this point already a little bit. There's a lot of people out there who are very, you know, religious about pure functional programming. They want as much clarity and correctness in their code as possible. And I do too. But you have to remember that you're solving different problems with each. Whenever you're talking about work that's going to be done on a thread and local on a box, you, you can make assertions using static typing that you are writing code that will work the way you intend. But there's nothing in the types world which will give you help about hardware failures or network splits or all the weird things that can go wrong in a real world deployment. That's the sort of thing Akka solves. And 
to me, they're like peanut butter and jelly. I don't know if people in Latvia eat peanut butter and jelly, but in, in the U.S., it's a joke for some things that taste really good together. So, a couple of use cases. In 2011, I was working for a really large cable company, the largest one in the United States, and it has 40 million customers. And back then, you had, does anybody watch On Demand on their, uh, on their TV? Maybe uh, watch a movie or watch a TV show you really like? When they built a system for this cable company, they used a big monolithic Oracle data store. And the data store was sitting there and was supposed to have all the information about customers and all the information about all the channels you could watch and all the information about what you could watch. And the problem became that over time, on demand became more prevalent. More people were watching on demand, there was more content for people to watch, and it started to overwhelm the Oracle database. It wasn't the monolith that was killing them in this case, it was the lack of isolation in data. And now, this database was getting all of these rights every time somebody called up and said, I want to be able to watch a channel or something like that. All those rights are coming in. They're trying to optimize the store for reads as well. And that's where you see DBAs really struggling. Uh, anybody who, anybody a DBA here? Okay. Oh, okay. So you know this problem, right? It's always the, the tricks that you're trying to pull to figure out how do I optimize for the right? How do I optimize for the read? Everybody wants both really fast, right? And that's not realistic. And you see databases internally doing their own little tricks to try and figure these problems out using things like indexes and views and whatnot. But those really represent the database trying to internally separate the write concerns from the read concerns. In this case, we decided that we had to pull from the monolith a set of functionality that represented your entitlements to watch TV what channels you had access to. Because every time you were clicking on your remote to go and look at the on-demand content, that was a web service call. So we needed to make this easier on the system so that these events wouldn't overwhelm it. And that meant splitting off this one section of troublesome logic that was overwhelming the database. Well, we wanted to create this live cache. And anybody you know who's heard the joke, you know, what are the two hardest things in, in computer programming. It's, you know, creating a live cache. I forget what the second one is. And then, you know, off by one errors. Uh, there's, there's, what's that? Naming things. Naming things. And then off by one errors. They, they say there's two things that's wrong, but then there's a third. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, we split this off in a meaningful way. And we couldn't have downtime because the problem with this is it's core to the business of something like a cable company that whenever people are clicking, they're probably doing that after dinner. They're probably doing that on a Friday evening or something like that. If they go down, who's going to come back and watch On Demand if it's always broken? So we originally sat down and architected a system that would, you know, use this Oracle store. And Oracle can emit events, right? So we, we could take the events that came out of Oracle and we would have this update handler that you see off to the left here. And it would receive the events from Oracle and then it would put them inside of RabbitMQ and then from RabbitMQ, we could have a bunch of workers on the other side who were responsible for generating transformed representations of what you could watch by your account and what you could watch by the MAC address of the devices that you had. And then we would put that all into Reoc. And Reoc is a really nice DynamoDB store that has you know, key value semantics, the simplest kind of data semantics you, you can find. So you have a key, the account ID, you have a key, the MAC address, and then you have all of the entitlements for the customer in each one of those buckets. And that's really nice. Uh, but the problem here becomes time. If you have a time-based system and you miss the event coming out of Oracle, or you don't handle it properly in the update handler, or you put in the message queue and the message queue drops it, Rabbit's pretty good, but it does lose stuff sometimes. And it doesn't tell you when it does that. And then worse yet, you could have failures over here in the transformers. And if you ever got into a point where these failures occurred, you might not end up with accurate state in REOC. And worse yet, you might not even know it. So this is a system that's actually very brittle. And if this happened, we realized that it was going to take two and a half hours to completely reload all the transformations for all the customers. That was unacceptable. 
So we had to think about a way to split this work out better. So I just described all the issues involved with this, so I'll just skip this slide. Instead, what if you thought about your system as always reconstituting itself? You can have a self-healing implementation. And in doing so, all I'm doing is saying, get the data from the Megacorp DB. You know, I have some data that I get once a day from various warehouse data places. And I'm just going to do the transformations. And I can break that up based upon what I consider the max number of accounts that I want to work on in each one. And therefore, make it a tunable, an external tune value as to what that number each one of these transformers does. And as a result, now I have a system which goes through and calculates all of the entitlements. When it finishes, it does it again. When it finishes, it does it again. Never, ever stops. And as long as Oracle knew that this account had changed somehow, it would eventually find its way into REOC. This is a really powerful way of looking at the system because now I don't care whenever I drop an event or something in this flow. Because I've got supervision watching over the actors, I can tell about the things that went wrong, and at least the things I didn't know about that went wrong, I, I could have behavior like restarting the actors. So that's nice, but it also comes with a couple other benefits that, were, uh, that aren't really part of this system. For example, REOC has the ability to um, do its own cleanup. So you could set it to have sessions. You could say that the data should only live for 15 minutes, and if it's not hit again, it should go away. That's not a number you want to use in the on-demand world. But you don't want to be trying to figure out how to delete a customer from a cache like this. This is where caching gets really hard. So instead, if I can say that my sessions in REOC are a day, and I don't update the data from Oracle, because you know how I'm constantly recalculating, constantly recalculating, constantly recalculating, if no recalculation for a customer happened within a day, REOC would tombstone it and it would go away and it wasn't my problem in my system whatsoever. Because deletes are the hardest thing to deal with. And that just magically took it away. Those kinds of systems, the ones where you are using the semantics of the tools to build self-healing applications, they're, they're when you have to turn your mind around to think about how you can do this. And it does come at a cost. It means that the business you know, in this case, the cable company, had to accept that they would always have machines constantly doing this work. But you know what? That was worth it to them compared to the cost of being down for hours with nobody being able to get access to their entitlements. Right? So I, I just talked about all those wins right there. Uh, the slides, by the way, will be available afterward if you want to read these again. Um, for another use case, this is the one I use in the book. And this is about state-based actors. These, these, by the way, were these were worker actors. They don't have the state inside of them, right? They, they, they may load something from a warehouse data store, but they're not tracking the state or changing the state or anything like that. And they're receiving messages that carry the state of, of things that are you know, account-specific down to them. So they're not really state-based actors. They're only state-based whenever you have to worry about changing state, right? In the use case too, we are talking about a case where state can be changing and we're representing a real world view of what's happening in our system live. And in this case, think of a bank account. If I have a system that's going to show you all of your accounts, like you log into your bank and it shows you every single account that you have in a single user interface, uh, it's going to retrieve all of them independently, but it's going to try and bring them back to you and show you as quickly as possible all of those different values, right? Um, and you should get those responses back within a certain amount of time. Everything we do in the systems that we build that are asynchronous have to be bound in both time and space. We have to make sure that we say it's going to happen within a certain amount of time. We also, like, we don't want to use too much memory or we don't want to use, you know, too much disk or whatever it is, but everything we have to think about is bound in time and space. So... In this particular case, the time bounding was the fact that we had to get our responses back within a specified time or send a timeout, right? And you can have a lot of flexibility in how you define various behaviors whenever you follow this kind of model. So I have something I call the cameo pattern. And this is sort of because, you know, we talk about actors in movies. It's actually very appropriate. I'm speaking here in a movie theater. 
um, in, in Hollywood, when a very famous person comes into a movie and does a really quick thing and leaves, you know, you see like Samuel L. Jackson come in or, uh, you know, Kate Winslet. Uh, whenever they do, um, but they're not a core person to the movie, we call that a cameo. And that's what this pattern represents, the idea that something is going to show up for a little bit, do some very important work, and then leave, right? And it's a lot like something we call the saga pattern, which is something that has existed for longer, and it's a whole theory around it, but it makes a lot more guarantees about things. This is like a much looser, uh, not as strict approach. So imagine that we have messages coming into an actor I call the request receiver, right? It's going to just have these messages in a queue. It's going to handle them one at a time. So it grabs message one off and says, OK, I need to get all the customer information for one person. And I'm going to spawn an actor that represents a context for that request. It's going to do all of the work around getting the information for that customer's bank accounts. And then it's going to be responsible for returning that to whomever asked for it. Message two, I do the same thing. Message three. I get another one. Message four, I get another one. Here's something where you do have to think about the space constraints. Where do I say I've got too many of these up and running? Like, do I just handle a million messages that are coming in and just keep spawning actor, spawning actor, spawning actor, spawning actor? No. You do want to put some guarantees in there about how many of these you can have up and running at a given time. So, these, these, Bubbles over here that represent the actors, that represent for one request, for one person's you know, group of accounts, I'm going to get the checking, I'm going to get the money market, I'm going to get the savings. These can represent transactions. How many people here have used at transactional? Okay, that's less than I'd expect, actually. I mean, it's, it's a powerful tool, right? If we didn't have at transactional in, from spring, we would we would be struggling with dealing with how we're going to say that these two things have to happen before an update is successful, right? And the problem is it's a blunt tool. It's either it succeeded or it failed. And there's not much you can do to tailor that behavior. But you can define any behavior you want in a context representing an actor here. So this actor here uh, for message one, it goes off and gets the three account informations and it returns it because it was successful. For number two, it gets two of the three. Maybe it got checking and savings, but it didn't get money market. What is the behavior you want for that specific case? Is it okay to return two out of the three? Do you retry the third one a certain amount of times? Again, bound in time. You don't want to do it forever. Maybe you do it with an exponential back off. It all depends, but you have the flexibility to do anything you want. And that's extremely powerful. Imagine if instead of this being retrieving account information, it was instead updating account information. You could define all kinds of unique and domain-specific behavior inside of these actors that represent transactional semantics. And that's nice. Um, so again, all of this code is on GitHub, so you don't have to you know, uh, copy it or anything like that. You can just download it. It's all free, and, and, and that includes all the tests that I wrote for this as well. So. Sometimes the question comes up, you, they know, people know I like futures, but there are times when I think futures are inappropriate, and it certainly does depend on a couple of questions. How composable is what I'm trying to do? You know, for example, in this case, I'm just getting back three responses from three different other systems, checking money market savings. Well, I compose that together into a single response, but I'm not worried about much beyond that. And the thing about futures is every time you create one, you are creating a certain amount of overhead. Each future has its own timeout. Each future has its own you know, uh, entry for the thread pool and stuff like that. You can shrink that down. You could say that I've created 10 futures and then do something where we invert that. We, we sequence those futures. So I go from having a sequence, you know, like a, a, an array list of, of futures to having a single future of an array list. That's nice. I can do these things, but it's still expensive because of all the things I was using up until I made that conversion. So I kind of tended to go away from using futures if performance was really important to my system. I wanted to 
minimize the impact of all these short-lived objects. Mind you, they're short-lived, but you can fill up new gen in your GC pretty quickly if you do this stuff too much. Um, so here's an example of what I'm talking about in futures. And is anybody here not familiar with Scala? Okay, a, a few. Um, this is a receive block. Every actor is going to have a receive block, and this defines the messages I can handle. In this case, I say in my receive, I have a case for get customer account balances. If I get a customer, if I get a message called get customer account balances, and I know I've got a value for the customer ID, well then I can say create a future for getting the values from the savings account. Create a future from getting the values from the checking accounts. And I'm sending on this message here, right? I'm, I'm passing it along to each one of those subsystems. The same thing for money markets. That defines the future, and then I say, I'm going to compose that work using this for comprehension. When I get savings values, when I get checking values, when I get money markets. And then, when I have all three, I can yield account balances of the three values. Now, you'll see all this garbage over here, this map two. That is downcasting because remember, actor interactions and messages are untyped. And that's not good because you can get a class cast exception here. What if the message that comes back from the other system is not the type that we expect, right? And in this case, for every one of the accounts I'm going out and asking for, I'm saying, you are giving me an option of a list of account data because I may not have a checking account. I may not have a savings account. And if I did have one, I might have more than one. I might have several checking accounts. I might have, se who knows, I might own businesses or whatever. So I have an option because I might not have data and I have a list because I might have more than one. An option of a list of you know, the ID to the balance values. Then whenever I'm done and I've gotten all these values back, I'm going to map over the future and apply this behavior to the result where I say, whoever asked me to do this work, send them the response. Send them the response that is inside my future balances that was derived from composing together all of those interactions. Does that make sense? Well, first of all, we, we know that downcasting is an anti-pattern in programming in general, right? But we also have a bug here, and it's kind of ugly. We have a problem here in time. When I'm doing this work, I have a receive block. The receive block is going to do its behavior on thread sequentially. It's going to create all three of those futures. But the futures are now going off and doing work independently on another thread. When this actor finishes defining its behavior, it is going to say, all right, well, now I'm done. I can get my next message. This has not yet been done because the responses may not have come back. This is all asynchronous coding. And I'm referencing the sender of the message that sent me this first request. By the time these responses come back, sender could be somebody else. I could be handling another message, and I don't know who that sender was that I was trying to send this data back to. So it's a really tricky, insidious bug, and I guarantee you, if you're an ACA developer, you've probably done this at least once. Anybody? Yeah, it's anytime you see sender, think about it. As a matter of fact, most of the uh, ACA team, anytime they reference sender, they put parentheses around it. They do that for a couple reasons, but one of them is to make it really clear that sender's being used here, and be careful with that. So one of the ways you could fix that with futures is to instead of mapping over the future balances, I instead say that I'm going to pipe the response to sender. And this behavior is evaluated at the time the future is created. So sender is captured at the appropriate time. But it's too tricky to play around with because nobody who doesn't understand that would know that looking at the code. <laughs> and nobody ever writes that in the comment. So, you know, I'm, I'm always leery whenever I see this, you know, did everybody think about this or, or not? Um, it's, it's just tricky to get right. So, 
in the actor approach, instead of using futures, I can I can send off messages to other actors and then define my own behavior with a single timeout for all of the interactions I want. And that's going to look a little bit more complex. In this case, I'm doing something that I personally hate. How many people here like lambdas? I hate them. I love functional programming, but if you want to hear a funny rant, uh, just Google, lambdas suck. I'm the number one hit. And, and there's many reasons for this, right? Anything that's anonymous on the JVM gives you very little help about what it does. But you, can, you can close over state from another actor outside of yourself. The, you uh, get terrible stack traces. And it's not a Scala thing. This is in Java 8. This is in Clojure. This is in Groovy. This is in JRuby. Anything anonymous gives you very little information in stack traces. And the worst part about it is it doesn't have a name. So you have to read it to figure out what it does. So I'm really against the idea of using anonymous anything. And that includes anonymous functions, which are lambdas. So let's get away from using anonymous lambdas and instead define a type of class that does the work that we want. And this is where I'm talking about a cameo actor. It is a known type, like a known famous person. And it has you know, uh, 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 the same behavior, but gives you much better stack traces. You can't close over things because nothing is wrapping it. right? That's really important. So in this case, this is the way the cameo pattern works. In the receive block, we handle two different types of things. One are all the responses for the requests we're about to make. But also, we have to respond to the fact that we could time out, right? The timeout is going to be sent back to me. This actor can send itself the fact that too much time has elapsed before the you know, work was completed. So in either case of when I got what I wanted or when I get a timeout, I have this method here which will send whichever response back to whoever I ask. And then I make sure I stop the actor. The thing about those actors I said that we create for every single request, you do not want them to live beyond their, their context. They should definitely be going away. And nothing will clean that up for you. And this is a great way to create a memory leak in your systems. So always remember to stop them. Now, now that I've defined what I want to do up here, I can send the request to start the actual work. And this is anybody who's done any kind of recursive coding you know, you define the method that does the work, and then you start the recursion at the end. This is sort of like that. You know, you define all the behavior, send the message to start the work, and then the last thing I do here is schedule a timeout to be sent to myself in 250 milliseconds, whatever you know, non-functional requirement you have, maybe 10 milliseconds, I don't know. But that means that now it's a race between the messages that I should get back from me creating work versus the timeout. So maybe one of them comes back, maybe none of them come back. Whoever gets into the queue for this actor's mailbox is the winner, and I could time out. In this case, I'm not doing anything fancy because it would be a lot more code to write all the different semantics of what I do if two out of three come back, or one out of three, or none. In this case, I just time out and don't respond with anything, or I give them all the responses. So again, remember to stop the actor. Don't create memory leaks. If you're using anything that represents a context, you have to remember to get rid of it when you're done. And then write tests. This is the biggest part of it. For people who are an ACA, ACA user here, how many of you fire more than one message at your actor at a time in your tests? See, yeah, OK, good. <laughs> because otherwise, you're not testing that the right response went to the right sender. So don't just send one message and then see if you got the response. Send five, right? Send several in your tests. And that way, you're making assertions that the right requester got the right response. Because it'd be bad for someone else to be getting my bank account information, right? And writing tests is actually pretty simple in the case of Akka because of this really nice thing called test probes. I create an individual probe for however many messages I want to send that represent different requests. And then I could say things like, within 300 milliseconds, when I sent get the customer account balances for the ID of one, well, I get a result, and I know it's going to be an account balances value. I can make an assertion that it's the right type of message. And then I can check that the values inside of it 
are exactly what I expect. But then asynchronously, I'm also sending another message and making sure I get the exact same response, uh, get, get the correct response for this user ID. So make sure you do this with your test, especially anytime you're doing anything inside the body of an actor that is asynchronous. And we can add non-functional requirements using things like the within clause, right? We're, we're making assertions that these tests have to be completed within 300 milliseconds. How many people are running their continuous integration environment on production hardware? Almost, really? Yeah, very few people do. It's always the last server that was about to be kicked out of the you know, entire company, right? It's never a good one. So the problem becomes, how do you make these non-functional assertions about time in tests that are going to run on really crappy boxes? Or worse yet, your laptop or something like that. The assertions you're making in these tests should be the non-functional requirements of your production system. Akka does have a facility to dampen these, these rates here, these 300 milliseconds. It'll, it'll say, you know what, scale it by a factor because I'm running on my laptop. Scale it by a factor because I'm running it on CI you know, environment. Uh, but then you do want to run these on production hardware and see that you're meeting your guarantees because you will see intermittent failures. And you need to understand that profile. You need to understand what percentage of my runs do not meet this non-functional requirement. So that's very important. And then write more tests. In this case, I'm checking to see that I get an error, you know, the timeout message, whenever I have a stub that never responds. This is one that will receive the message, but never ever sends a response back. And so I should know that that should not come before my non-functional requirement for the timeout. It shouldn't come at, you know, uh, 100 milliseconds. That would be weird. So I want to test those sort of things. Using the exact numbers can be really tricky, though. The timers in Akka are based on something called a hashed wheel timer, which is not a precise instrument. And Netty uses the exact same thing. This is a this is a, the pattern for best practices around these timer mechanisms, but uh, they're not 100% precise. So don't make your numbers, you know, like I said, 250 milliseconds. You probably want to make that like 230, right? Something that gives you a little bit of leeway because you don't want tests fail failing just because it was 249, right? Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to kind of go through the best practices really quickly. Um, but the slides give a lot of, a lot of um, context if you read them again later. Avoid complexity of coordination. If you can avoid things like order, right? If you can avoid things like timing, if you can, uh, that is order. Uh, if you can avoid things like coordination, like this has to happen over here, then this has to happen over here, then you have simpler, linearly scalable systems. What you want is to be able to pull things out of a queue and do some transformations on it and put it somewhere else. And as long as there's no coordination between anything else, you linearly scale more nodes and you have n times whatever the number of nodes, that much more throughput. That's where you want to be. And don't ever create actors by doing this sort of business. The syntax for creating actors in Akka kind of sucks, actually. I'm saying within my actor context here, create a new actor and wrap it with the configuration properties of its name, right? But I'm going to use the type signature type of the actor I'm creating here instead of saying new account balance response handler, right? Use the new even whenever there is no arguments. Because the second you do add arguments here, this does not fail at compile time. And then, you know, you'll find out at runtime that you're creating things the wrong way and nobody wants to find out there. So always use new. There's something very boilerplate that we talk about, like creating a props factory. Inside of the singleton associated with, you know, the companion object associated with my actor, I can define a method called props and take all the arguments I want and then, you know, create the actor inside of this object. There's a good, really low-level reason to do this. It eliminates the ability for people to get access to the underlying actor and be able to call methods on it because you still could do that using reflection. Where you create the instance of the actor is captured in the metadata for that instance. So people could technically break that. Now, I've, I've never seen anybody do it, and if you ever did in your code base, you'd probably take somebody and say, what are you doing? That's not good practices there. But it all gets back to uh, the concept I'll talk about shortly called this. Um, keep your actors simple. 
Don't have them do tons of different things. Have them responsible for one kind of behavior. It'll make debugging so much simpler. And be explicit in your supervision. Don't supervise multiple kinds of actors. Here's what I mean. If we look at that customers and accounts and devices and the applications in that hierarchy I was showing before, well, what if my customer actor was supervising both accounts and devices? That's bad because what if the exact same kind of exception occurred in device that could occur in account, but you want different behavior for each one? You can't differentiate very easily. So instead, what you want to do is create it's an actor that is nothing more than a supervisor to the accounts, a supervisor to the devices. And that way you can be very explicit in the way you handle failure for each one of those types. Uh, use failure zones, and by that I'm really talking about isolation. We want to make sure that thread pools are not starving other actors. If we have, and this is, you know, ACA, whenever you're new to it, the first thing you do is just start using the thread pool that comes with ACA. And it can go up to like 64 threads on a big box eventually you're going to start seeing timeouts. So when you see timeouts occurring in your system and you don't know why, the odds are you're starving your actors for threads. And you need to define more threads in dispatchers so that you have you know, enough for all these actors to do their work. The most important part of it is you want to make sure that anything is blocking is not on the same thread pool as work that is non-blocking. All the actor interactions where we're sending messages are generally non-blocking. But what if one of those actors receives a message and then goes off and does a JDBC call? Well, if it's using the same thread pool as the non-blocking actors, it's going to steal a thread and waste it, and all the other ones can't use it until that JDBC call comes back. You don't want that. Now, the question always comes up between push, pull, and back pressure. Should I be pulling from a producer? Should I be grabbing work from them, work stealing semantics? Should I be pushing work down to workers? They each have their own mailbox, their actors. You know, should I just keep pushing things at them? The answer is really neither. And this is where ACA streams became so important. You don't want to overwhelm your workers because you're pushing too much stuff down to them. You don't want to overwhelm your producer because you're not pulling work off of it quick en quickly enough. But if you have back pressure semantics, you can always communicate what I can do, how much work I can handle, and you never have to think in terms of push or pull. It's really, it's, it's sitting in between both. We want granular messages. Don't use messages that are big events that make the entire world of actors in your system all respond. That leads to event storms and can really hurt your performance. Use very specific messages. And don't reuse messages. Always use a new message. Never say, well, that message sort of does what I want, so I'll use it again over here. That conflates the intent of the message. And if it ever changes for one of them and not the other, you lose meaning, and it makes it really hard to debug things. So create a message for every single one of the interactions that you're, crea that you're talking about. And the same thing goes for exceptions, because in ACA, exceptions are messages. You want to have all the exceptions that represent your domain, and this is where I get on my soapbox about domain-driven design and domain events and how we're really good about defining success but not good at defining all the things that can go wrong. Right? We should. They're messages, and we can treat them the exact same way. Never, ever reference this. And by that I mean the open recursion this that we see in object-oriented languages like C++, like Java, Scala. Right? This is a keyword that represents me, my instance, or anything like that. But if I ever use it, it's very possible that I might send it to somebody. And if they have a reference to this, then they have the ability to call a method on that instance. You never, ever want to think in terms of this with actors. You always want to think in terms of the self. The self is a reference to an actor. You can only send messages to it. So anytime you're doing something with actors, don't ever use this use self instead. And that will keep you honest and make sure you don't ever you know, expose your actor to someone who can then introduce concurrency into it. Remember, the actors handle one message at a time. So there, unless you introduce it, there is no concurrency inside the actor. It's all going to be, you know, uh, there's no locks required or anything like that. Well, if you introduce this, 
now somebody else on another thread can call into the actor, and you do have concurrency issues. So don't ever do it. And the one exception I have to that is JMX. Anybody use JMX with their actors? Do it. The number one reason for this is that no um, monitoring system will ever tell you the state inside of your actors. The only way to expose that is really through JMX. So you define for your actors that have state an MX bean. And the actor's path name is a really good object name in, uh, in JMX. You just use the actor path name, and it creates, in the mBeans view of you know, Visual VM or J Console, a hierarchical view of all your actors that are live in the system right at this moment. And you can see the state. Don't use operations inside of your actors you know, on the MX bean. Only have getters to see the state. And I've found that to be pretty harmless. It's never once bitten me. So I really like using JMX for this. And always make sure that the messages that you send, the messages have to be immutable. And the state they contain has to be immutable as well. That may mean, particularly in Java, that you have to either wrap or take all the data that's in a collection and put it into an immutable one, right? But it's safer to do that, even if it stinks to do it from a time perspective. It's safer to your system, and you won't ever have somebody else changing state on you whenever you're passing them data. One of the things that I'm particularly uptight about is I want to externalize logic. If I can put all the behaviors in an actor inside of an object, then it's more testable, and I don't care about the, the, the actor interactions to test all of that. And I can't close over state. I can't do anything except for what I pass as an operand to my methods or functions. So externalize logic into singletons, and you will make sure that there is no state that gets messed with here or anything like that. This is a pretty extreme view. Not everybody does it, but early on, this is something I learned to do a lot because the old Scala actors were, were tough to deal with in this regard. And then, you know, when you log stuff out, make sure it's really readable. Debugging actors is hard. Who likes debugging actors? It has nothing to do with actors. It's asynchronous systems. Go, closure, anything asynchronous, you know, like core, like core async or, um, you know, goes channels and go routines, you can't figure them out. You just have to write stuff out and then you add more log statements and more log statements and just trying to hopefully figure out that one thing that caused that one thing to go wrong. Make the logging as good as possible. But then there is good news. Monitoring is back inside of Akka. Well, um, come on is really good. I know the people who make it. I'm, I'm big fans of theirs. But we have monitoring in Akka that you can now consume as an event stream. And you can either use StatsD or something like that. And, and you know, you, you, you can bolt on a UI if you want, or you can use your own, the ones that you already have. And you get all the information about the latencies of message handling from the time they come into the mailbox to the time they are dequeued to be handled to the time that they are done handling the message. And whenever actors start and shut down, all that good stuff. Um, so there, monitoring is back. Um, and it's an SPI that you can tap into the event stream and do anything you want with. The key thing about this that was really hard for us, we tried monitoring once before. We tried to monitor everything. It doesn't scale. Even though we did a dapper implementation, the Google dapper paper, it doesn't scale to monitor everything in asynchronous systems, large ones. Instead, this monitoring allows you to turn on and off the things you want to monitor. That's super important because then you can say, I only want to see this, and I'm not overwhelming some UI trying to keep up with all the things that are going on. And even better, has anybody tried async debugger? This is the coolest thing ever. You have a debugger which allows you to walk message sends. If you go to my repo here, uh, Jamie Allen, I have an async debugger demo. Tells you exactly how to get it set up. I know it's Eclipse. I know not everybody likes it. I'm, I, we're, we're not in IDE wars. I totally want this to be in IntelliJ as soon as possible. It's all open source. They can have it. The point is you can walk message sends. You can walk back and see the state of the actor at the time it sent the message. This is incredible. So it's a very powerful tool for trying to figure out, why didn't I get this message? Why did I not handle this message? I thought that it was in here in my receive block. Maybe I'm switching my behaviors through you know, become. So any questions? There's 30 seconds left. <laughs> uh, here's one. Who wants a bear? Oh, you're first. <laughs> All right. Um, 
I, you know, I'm, I'm really disappointed that I, I can't stay longer for the rest of the conference and stuff like that. I, I unfortunately have to leave tonight, but uh, thank you for having me.